Hi, welcome to The Bridge Connection. Really glad you joined me today. Uh, what we're doing this week started yesterday. Uh, Sunday morning is, this coming Sunday morning is Palm Sunday. It's traditionally called. Uh, this is the triumphant entry. Jesus into Jerusalem that begins his Passion Week on the way to the cross. So what I decided what we would do started uh, yesterday. And what we're going to do all these uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we're going to just talk about the, uh, some of the things, some of the parables, some of the encounters, some of the statements, some of the teaching that Jesus made during this time, because I think that's so important that uh, what he was saying during this time is he knows where he's going, he's, he knows what's ahead of him. In fact, he even tells him in these verses that it, what's going to happen, they still don't get it, but he tells his disciples. So he knows what's happening. And uh, so I think we could learn from that. And these things are very important. So, uh, and then we'll do a... Uh, we, It'll take us into Sunday. Sunday, we will talk about the triumphal entry and, and what happened on that day and what he did on that day when he got there. Uh, it's very interesting. And then we will pick it up on Monday and we'll talk about the, the days prior. We'll go to each day prior to the crucifixion on what he did on each one of those days and what happened to him. So join with us. I thought that would give us a bigger picture of uh, this season since we have this opportunity to be together. So join with me. Find the Gospel of Mark in your Bibles. Turn there with me if you have them with you uh, and turn to chapter 10. And we're going to read a story about a man and Jesus. We're going to pick it up at verse 46 in chapter 10, Gospel of Mark. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still, commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. This is a picture of a man needing, needing help and needing this help desperately. As we read this story, there's, there's no question but that the man's blindness is a picture for us of the blindness of darkness and the needs of the world and, and the, the, the needs that we have in, in, in the multitudes of people in desperation, even right now in, in the world. You know, the, the need may be physical, the need may be mental, the need be, may be emotional, it may be spiritual, it may be some problem with the mind, maybe some desperate loneliness or some tragic sin, uh, and uh, what, whatever it is, maybe it's something we, we're hanging on to and can't get rid of and it's bothering us, we want to come to Jesus, or, or we're so maybe getting depressed because of the, the loneliness or the aloneness that we're having right now, or whatever. Uh, this passage kind of kind of lays out for us a way to get to him, a way to get ourselves prepared, a way to take these needs that we have, these obstacles, these whatever they are, and get them to Jesus. Now, I told you that uh, Jericho is about 17 miles from Jerusalem. It's thought to be maybe the oldest city in the world. It was Passover season, which means that Thousands of pilgrims are making their way to Jerusalem. So the pilgrims were passing right through Jericho. They would come in one end of Jericho and just march out the other. And there would be just tons of people because thousands would go to Jerusalem uh, for these feasts. Uh, it's, it's possible that Bartimaeus had heard that Jesus was in Jericho. Um, and so maybe he thought this was his best chance to find Jesus to station himself at the city limits where Jesus would be passing as he left the city because that's where he was. Whatever the case, that's speculation, I don't know. Whatever the case, Bartimaeus had to beg for a living. So he sat by the gate, the main highway, begging. You know, <laughs> we, we need to be where Jesus is. We need to go where he is. You know, and, and sometimes we're just going where he is is nothing more than getting on our knees and seeking him and praying and praying with, with diligence and and perseverance. We'll talk about that in a few moments. And, 
And, uh, but that's where Jesus is. You know, it's not a location. It's not going to a certain church or, you know, where everybody's complaining. And I am too, that we can't be in our facility and we can't be what we call our church. And we know the people are the church, but we can't go home to where we meet and prepare for life and all of those things. And, and uh, I think God wants to show us during these times, guys, that uh, he's everywhere. He's here in this house with me. You know, there's been nobody else in this house for over two weeks now except me and and uh, me and Jesus. And that's, that's, that's an okay thing because he's there to meet every need. And I've, I've had needs. I've had needs of, of uh, loneliness. I've had needs of, of uh, desperation. I've had needs of, of various things in my life. And, and so going to where he is, as, as Bartimaeus did, but us going to where he is is just where we are, man. There he is. Stop. Acknowledge his presence. Whether you get on your knees or whether it's driving your car, don't get on your knees if you're driving your car. But if you're driving somewhere, if you're walking somewhere around the block, or you're doing something, bring him into it, man. Go where he is. Bring those needs to him. Whatever the case, Bartimaeus had to beg for a living. So he sat there, man. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That's why I say he's always there. He's always near, so call upon him. All right, now verse 47 says, we're going to take this, you know, verse at a time. Now go back through it this way, verse 47. And when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The, one of the first things of help, getting help from, from Jesus is, is believing who he is, having faith, believing testimonies. Other people have talked to you in the past. They've talked to me and they've, told me this, and God has done this, is God, God has done that. And, and I, I glean on those. I want to glean from those things. And I, I, I take those things. And I want to remember what people say about Jesus. And I want to remember the testimonies. And I want to remember what I heard somebody teach or somebody sit down and share with me what God's done in their life, you know? And, and at this particular point, Bartimaeus is just hearing all kinds of noises coming from the people passing by. There were the noise of individuals, of groups, of probably whole caravans, families of people. Uh, he heard the noise of people tramping along their feet, probably heard the noise of some animals walking with them. There was conversation. There was no doubt laughter. Uh, kids were playing. He would hear that, children playing. He heard all kinds of talking, probably some serious things, some jovial things, some commercial things, vain things, rude things, off-color things, religious things. But then something happened. The size of the crowd and the noise and the talk, it changed. The passers-by became not just passers-by one at a time or family at a time, but they became a throng. It was a multitude of people. And the noise and the talk, it was all about Jesus, the one for whom he had hoped and longed that he would, he would hear from. And, and Bartimaeus had been blind for years, maybe for life, with, with absolutely no hope of seeing. Apparently, he was a beggar with no one to care for him. But then the most glorious event of his life happened. He heard about one called Jesus of Nazareth, who was claiming to be the, the true Messiah. For the first time in his life, there was hope swelling up in him. And he, wow, he, he heard that this man would touch people in there. They could hear, they could see. Uh, he healed lepers. Uh, he'd heard about the dead being raised. And so he began to have a, a, a stirring in his own life of saying, I, I'm, I want this. I can believe that this could be for me. So hope swelled up in him. He knew there was a possibility that he might be healed and, and able to see. And from the very first day that he heard about Jesus, he had hoped and longed for the chance when Jesus might pass by. Why? Because he believed what people were saying. He was believing what, what he had heard. You know, we have to believe the testimony about Jesus. All Bartimaeus ever heard about was what he heard. What, that's all he had, I mean, is, is what he heard. That, that was everything he had. He didn't read any books. And there, there was no campaigns on television. He just heard people talking. He only knew the testimony of people. He heard what they were sharing. He heard they were sharing, he's the Messiah. He's the son of David. And he began to believe their testimony. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
Another step to getting help is acknowledging our personal need. The first step is recognizing that he's here. He's right here. He's not going to walk by us. And we got to, we got to grab him when he's walking by. He's here. Today is the day of salvation. Whatever needs you have today, you can lay it before Jesus today. Now, as soon as Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus, he instantly began shouting out to attract him, creating as much fuss and noise as he could above the crowd and, 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 and its noise. The point is this. Bartimaeus acknowledged his need and he confessed it publicly. He didn't approach Jesus secretly or quietly, say, would you get him to pray for me and we'll see what happens? He had a desperate need and he accepted the fact he wanted the help of Jesus no matter what. He wanted Jesus' help. So he cried out for mercy, not for anything else. He was blind. He was a beggar. He didn't cry for housing. He wasn't asking for clothing. He didn't want food. He cried for his most basic need was for mercy. Verse 48, then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Many among the crowd tried to, tried to hush this guy up, but he was desperate. He was determined. He, he, was, he was earnest. He was, he was, this was going to happen. He wasn't going to be discouraged. He wasn't going to be silenced. He wasn't going to, nobody was going to stop him. Nobody was going to tell him this, this won't work. Or, it's just a religious thing. You know, try that. No, that's no good. You, you know, take care of yourself. He repeatedly cried to the top of his lungs, son of David, have mercy on me. The point is that Bartimaeus persevered. He had need. He would not stop seeking to have his need met. The voices raised against him. It says they were many. His faith was strong. He believed Jesus could really help him. His face stood against all the voices of discouragement and against the feelings of so many that his case was just useless. Listen to me. Perseverance is the answer to desperate needs. Persevering prayer and persevering faith. Um, one, of the, one of the teachings or events that happened during this week, and we might do it this week. I'm, I'm not sure. I made up my mind on all the other teachings, but... Um, there was the lady that came to Jesus. You know, the story about the lady, this was a parable. The lady came to a judge and just wore him down. Came day after day after day. He didn't want to hear her. He wasn't going to do anything for her. But she was so persistent. She kept coming. She kept coming. And he was a judge. I don't, I don't have fear of God. I don't fear man. I don't fear anybody. But man, give, give her what she wants. Get her away from me. And then Jesus says, now God's like that. But he wasn't saying that he... That, that he's unjust, like this is not what he's saying. He was saying that perseverance, power in prayer is found in persistence. Uh, persistence will keep, see there's reason for persistence. We, we wonder why he doesn't answer readily. We wonder why, and, and that's, why we, that's how we pray so much of the time. We're, we're, we're not persistent, we're, we're not persevering, we're, we're not praying for for, for a long period of time or often for the same thing. If it doesn't happen, I don't go, you know, God didn't, didn't, I'll do my own thing or whatever we do, man. But we don't understand what it means to persevere. One of the reasons that he wants us to be persistent is there's several reasons. One of them is it keeps us in his presence. He knows as long as we're coming to him in prayer and seeking him, we're in his presence and he can speak to us. He can deal with us. He's, he's more concerned about raising us and just meeting our needs because he'll take care of the needs. He, he'll, he'll give us the best, but the best may not always be what we think it is. He'll take care of our needs. But as we're praying and we're praying time after time after time, maybe for the same thing, then he knows that's allowing us to be in his presence. We're there. And I think it helps us refine our requests as we're praying persistently uh, because our requests be made are, are beginning to refine themselves according to as well. I found over the, oh my, so many times, man, praying for something and it doesn't happen. I keep praying, I keep praying. And pretty soon I find myself praying from a different perspective, praying in a different way. And all of a sudden I realize I'm praying God's will. I'm beginning to see more of God's will than Chuck's will. And so I think that is so important. So sometimes there's that, there's that delay because God's up to something and he's doing something in, in my life. Um, Persistent prayer also takes out the, the plan B category. Uh, persistent prayer can't be the latch, our last ditch effort. I know so many people that, you know, uh, uh, nothing else works and let's pray. 
when it, when it's going to be a, a persistent prayer and I'm going to pray until I see it, man, um, I'm telling you, it's not going to be last. It's going to be first. And I am so convinced on persistent prayer. I know my, my own mom, oh, she, my, my mom and dad, uh, my mom knew the Lord. She had a great relationship. My grandparents, her mom and dad, and, and my mom, my dad's mom, she was a, a strong believer, but my dad wasn't for the, and I, and I, I think it was probably, um, probably the first 30 years of, of her marriage, maybe 25 or 30 years, um, all the time that I was home, uh, the marriage wasn't all that great. Uh, my dad wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't real, what wasn't real great, uh, because he didn't have the Lord. And uh, he wasn't, you know, evil, but he wasn't very good to, to my mom. And she prayed and prayed and prayed. I would go, go by her bedroom at times and, and I'd hear her. I know she's kneeling beside her bed um, and she's praying, praying for her family, praying for her husband, praying for her two sons. And, and uh, I want to tell you, she prayed and prayed and prayed. Today, if we don't get an answer, you know, and I, I, I've, I've had couples come to me and say, we've got to get a divorce because I don't, he won't receive the Lord or he won't, you know, whatever. How long have you been married? All oh, six months, eight, with two years, whatever. Come on, man. <laughs> That's not the commitment. Commitments, you make it. And my dad, once he received the Lord, God answered her prayer. God answered mom's prayer. And my dad received the Lord. So did my brother and so have I, obviously. And uh, all because of her prayers, no doubt about it. My dad had such a turnaround. He became the nicest, best man I've ever known in my life. And I'm not just saying that because of my dad. He wasn't always like that. But when he received the Lord, he became, and those of you that know him, you know that. He was an, an unbelievable man. Just loved the Lord and would do anything for anybody, you know. Um, 49. So Jesus stood still. That's why I believe in persistent prayer. That's why I pray persistently because I saw it work. It's worked. It's not a matter of just a, 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 a key that'll make it work. It's persistent prayer gets us to know Jesus. It's not just always, you know, it's we begin to hear him, see him, understand him. And in that process, we're being conformed into his image. It's just an incredible process that he offers us and most of us reject so much of the time. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer, rise. He is calling you and throwing aside his garment. He rose and he came to Jesus. Jesus stood still and says, this crowd must have been huge. And Jesus wanted to spend time with the man. So he had somebody send for him. He couldn't reach Jesus by himself. So Jesus said, go, go get him. And because the man was so persistent, um, crying out and yelling, despite all of the people saying, be quiet, be quiet. This, no, you don't need this. He's busy. I mean, how many times have we said we're trusting God for this? And people say, what are you doing? I'm praying. They say, what else? You know, I'm praying. And they say, well, what else? I'm praying. When, when it's time for me to do something, God will show me what to do, but I'm praying. I'm going to do it. What is, I'm doing that, but I'm praying. And always making sure that we know that it's Jesus that's in control and he's in charge. You know. But anyway, Jesus never turned away a man who cried for help. John 6, 37 says, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no way cast out. So the man took off his coat, threw it down. This is an interesting act. He wanted nothing to hinder from him reaching Jesus as quickly as he could. And in one motion, he cast aside the hindrances, sprang to his feet, and moved towards Jesus. And, and you know, you see the eagerness, his eagerness to reach Jesus and allowing nothing to hinder him. That's where I want to be. That's where I want you to be. That's where we all need to be. An eagerness to touch Jesus every day of our lives, man. Every moment. What a lesson for us. How few of us are so eager. How many hang on to that which hinders and hampers us and that those things that keep us from, from reach, reaching Jesus and we just keep those hanging on to those things, man. Let's get him to Jesus. Let's be what he wants us to be, man. 51. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well and immediately received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. <laughs> oh, man. He had no, he didn't waver at all, man. 
What do, what do you need? I, I, I need you to be merciful. I, I want to see. He was like, not like so many that are vague in their prayers. He, he, he had examined himself. He knew precisely what he needed. And um, Matthew says in 21, 22, and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And uh, that's what we need to be doing, guys. Bartimaeus needed, however, to make a personal confession to Jesus. Jesus, of course, knew what Bartimaeus needed, but the Lord, knowing about the man's need was not enough. The man had to make a personal confession of Jesus. Matthew 10, 32, 33. Whoever therefore shall confess me before men, him I will confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, him also I will deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Bartimaeus needed to confess his faith in Jesus and, and for the sake of the other standing there, you know, so they needed to know that it was faith in Jesus that, that saved the man. Romans ten thirteen, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now look at this. Jesus had told Bartimaeus, you go now, go, go your way. But he didn't do that. Not after his master had touched his ham, as they had touched him, Bartimaeus clung to Jesus. Nothing was going to pry him away. He followed Jesus in the way. Oh, there are some great lessons here. Appreciation, thankfulness, uh, genuous of conversion. He followed through and, and on and on and on. And I, I just want to say to you that if, if you're watching right now and um, with this story, I want to talk to the believers in closing in just a minute, but I want to talk to you if, if you're not sure, if you have a relationship with Jesus, hear him say to you, he said, come to me, all you the labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Jesus wants to know you. He knows you. He wants you to know him. This event that we're looking forward to in uh, less than two weeks, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that was all about you. It was all about you, man. Jesus went to the cross and died because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus died, shed his blood, so you don't need to shed yours. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you shall be saved. That's all you need to do today, friend. That's all you need to do. And maybe there's just one person watching. I don't know how many that are watching that, that needs to make this decision today. And all you need to do is just, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me. Be merciful to me. I receive you into my life. I choose to believe that you died for me. I'm a sinner. And I choose to believe that you died for me. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. And then tell somebody you, you prayed to receive Jesus. Maybe somebody there in your home, maybe a family member that knows Jesus. Uh, maybe you can call somebody that's been talking to you about Jesus. Text somebody. You can call our office, 760-324-8281, and they'll plug you into somebody that would love to talk with you and pray with you, get you started, answer questions if you'd like. Uh, we would love to do that. In fact, to the church, I say now, uh, we need to be a praying church. We need to be a persistently praying church. We need to be praying for this pandemic. We need to be praying for the families that have been touched uh, with disease and death. We need to pray for the workers and the health. We're going to pray for all of those in just a moment, but we also want to pray individually for anybody that wants to be prayed for. If you have a need, you know somebody that, that, that has a coronavirus, uh, you're, you're scared about something, or you need help, or just want to talk to somebody or pray with somebody, call our office, and we'll plug you in with somebody that would love to do that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who maybe prayed today to receive you. Would you confirm that in their hearts, that you are who you say you are, and they are now your child? They're in your family. I thank you for that, sweet Savior. I pray for all that are working so hard on this pandemic, Lord. I pray for our governments and the officials and all the ones that are making decisions that they would be godly decisions. I thank you that we have some men in government that pray and seek you before decisions are made. And I thank you for that, Lord. I ask that there would be prayer times with 
with individual leaders in this nation seeking you for where we should go. You know, we've, we've turned our back on you, Lord, as a nation, and uh, we want to come home. We want to come back. I ask that you would touch the heart of every believer in every church, every believer. By the time we leave our homes, we would be so inspired by you and your love for us and what you've done that um, this, this nation would turn back to you. We thank you for that, Lord. We pray for healthcare workers. Oh, Jesus, we pray for the doctors and we pray for the nurses and, and we pray for the EMTs and just everybody that's involved, Lord, that you would meet their needs and keep them safe and keep them well and keep them whole. We just give it all to you, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. See you tomorrow, okay? God bless you.